Cooks, shoot your arrows! Cooper Cup plucks it out of the air and gives the Rams the lead. Robert Wood, touchdown! LA! Ball goes crashing into the end zone! Aaron Donald almost beat the football there. Corey Littleton, have yourself a day. Picked off, Marcus Peters. Coming off the edge, and Ryan will be wrapped up by Clay Matthews. Everett in stride! Wow! Franklin Myers gets his hand down there. Leno got a hand on it, did he pick it? He did! Racing down the sideline is a key to lead. Gurley for MVP! Touchdown LA! Picked off by John Johnson. Well, Dante Fowler, who is able to get to breathe. Greg Zerline sends the Rams to the Super Bowl! Oh! LA wow. will play for the Lombardi! Welcome back, guys, to episode 225 of the Downtown Rams podcast. Jake Ellenbogen here with Alexis Kraft. We're your hosts. And uh, we got a show for you today after a while. There hasn't been a lot to talk about. OTAs can be relatively boring. And we don't like to talk about certain things like talking up Jared Goff because they're not even wearing pads at this point. So um, we're here. Uh, There's some news about Todd Gurley, but there's also some news about Alexis Kraft. So if you haven't been following her Twitter, uh, she got absolutely pulverized. Um, and she'd like to tell you the story about it before we carry on. Yeah. So I broke the internet. I officially did it. Um, I'm not sure if I'm proud of it or not. I mean, it, it, so everyone, I just want to, we're going to start from the beginning, Jake, because I think it's really important to be very thorough in this discussion and not leave out any details so I can let the listeners decide for themselves how they feel. Uh, but basically, everyone on Twitter has kind of been doing those quarterback tier things, right? I mean, you did one the night before I did it. I've been seeing them on there. And I made one. I I put it out there. Um, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't, like, erring on the side of controversy. So, like, I stand by my picks. But if, if there was a decision to be made with the quarterback and I wasn't sure if I should put him in A or B, or, or whatever, I was going to go with the one that I thought would be most controversial because that's the point, right, to start discussion at that point. Um, but that's also my personality, as I'm sure people know at this point. Uh, but I posted it, um, and it caused mania. I mean, it. I literally – I'm looking at this tweet right now, and if I go to, like, tweet activity – um, 66,000 people interacted with my tweet. Um, and you know, and I'm not saying that to be like relevant or anything. I'm saying that this is how mad people were because, you know, people, um, Jake, we've talked about this. People will like make excuses for their favorite quarterback, right? Yeah. You're always going to think your quarterback is better than they are unless your quarterback is like complete trash. And even then you're going to probably still be like, oh, well, they're OK. Um, so it's to be expected. And in most of uh, and I, I'm not going to go through my whole list here. I'm not going to read all 32 uh, rankings because there is a YouTube video out. May I add Um that I made in response to this controversy and you can go on um, YouTube and just search ASMR NFL QB rankings with Alexis Kraft of downtown sports network. Yes. It's another ASMR video. Yes. I know I said I would never do one again, but I did. I threw it out there. Um, It's interesting to say the least. I read some of the best responses I got to my quarterback tier, but Jake, I'm going to go ahead and call this tier gate. No. Why why would you do such a thing? Because it was controversial. It made a lot of people mad. And I won't be shocked if I end up getting investigated by some type of committee. It was, as some people are calling it, a crime. Um, Did I think I was committing a crime at the time it happened? No. Um, Do I think it's a crime now? No. But uh, people felt a lot. And you know because you saw – on Twitter, it was in it was insane, and um, I'm happy about it because I like I don't like causing chaos, but I thrive off chaos. Chaos, Jake, you know that. Um, 
I find it funny. Now, the parts that weren't funny was there was a large group of people, obviously, that came in with the misogyny and the sexism and all that. But like that's to me, unfortunately, it's like to be expected. And I'm kind of used to that. So like that kind of wasn't cool. I'm still not used to it. You're like, Jake, calm down. It's no big deal. I'm like, no, like I'm ready to go to war. (laughs) Right. I mean, yeah, it's um. Uh, you know, that was something that I was kind of expecting. I mean, not, you know, all the responses that were like kitchen or is my laundry done or like that type of thing. Uh, but you know, I, I would say overall, even though like 90% of people were mad, at least it was like creating discussion because my favorite part is when people started arguing with each other in my mentions. So like someone would say something and then someone would would argue with that person. And I'm sitting here watching this unfold. And all I could think of was the April Ludgate quote from Parks and Rec, where she's like, it's my favorite kind of battle. Two men enter, one me leaves. Because it was like that. And I was watching it and I was like, well, at least it's discussion. I mean, at my expense, but, um, you know, just to give some context, here was the most controversial uh, rankings, I should say, that I had. So I so the rankings go elite, borderline elite, above average, average, unknown, and then below average. I had Matt Ryan as an above average quarterback. Now, people were livid that I did not have him in borderline elite or elite. I don't know what kind of world we're living in. Like, like, yes, has Matt Ryan had elite or borderline elite seasons? Yes. But right now, I just look at him as an above average quarterback. So people were like fuming at that. Uh, people were mad that I had Cam Newton in average. Um, he's been playing at an average level. Can he surpass that? Yes, obviously. But he's not playing. People thought he was borderline elite as well. He's not playing like that. I don't know what they're thinking. Um you know, Lamar Jackson, I had as above average, which I guess I can get why people are mad about that. Um, I had, you know, what's weird to me about this is what I was expecting to get flack for was I had Eli Manning as an average quarterback. And I thought for sure people would be coming at me hard for not having him in the below average category. And I think like one person said something about that. Is that not insane? Like more people were mad that I had Matt Ryan as an above average quarterback than people were mad about me putting Eli Manning as average. And a surprising number of people were really mad that I had Matt Stafford ranked as an average quarterback because they thought he should be above average. And that's a whole nother discussion, but we don't need to talk about mental illness. I just, <sighs> I don't know. I mean, I didn't like, here's the thing. I totally didn't agree with everything you put there, but like I understood your reasonings now i i wouldn't like with like the josh allen i didn't see much different than uh josh allen and matt ryan like i would disagree with that but like the thing is i think people need to just learn how to be able to disagree and the, the, another thing is with tear maker we use that to start a conversation it's it's to gain um, you know, discussion. It's really, mm-hmm. uh, it's been awesome uh, for, you know, everybody except for you, apparently. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, oh, it I has, loved it. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. Like you, you handled it extremely well. I was proud of you, but what am I not? So, um, you know, like I think tier maker is cool because it's such a dead period right now, you know? And so, um, you know, I know there's probably like Rams listeners right now, like, all right, get to the Rams talk. But I mean, like for real though, like, I mean, I, I didn't agree with everything you had to say, but I, mean, I wasn't going to be like, wow, this, this is trash. Get back in the kitchen. Like I just like comments with misogyny are what drove me to another level. Like I, I like I've always said like to you, I'm like, I'm going to let you do your thing. You can fight your own battles. You can protect yourself. I'm not going to step on your toes. But when someone gets like that, I think that calls for some backup. And um, shout out to the Ramley because they definitely had your back. I mean, I think mm-hmm. everyone came in droves uh, to basically, you know, back you up. And, um, you know, Hector on uh, Twitter, you know, basically it was like, you know, you could put yourself and, and Kayla in a room and you guys could be talking, you know, football nonstop. And I mean, you'd know more than just about any of the guys that, you know. Um, you know, commented on you and, and I, what I said, 
um, was, you know, basically a bunch of guys that, you know, get their, their quarterback rankings based on, you know, Madden uh, overall ratings in a video game. So that's kind of how, like, I just didn't really take most of them seriously. Um, especially like there was like dad Prescott. Oh gee. I wonder why he's mad at your <laughs> rankings. Like, you know what I mean? So, um, I liked where you had golf though, you know, cause I guess we'll, we'll kind of carry into this, uh, unless you had more to add, do you, you know, no, just go watch. I, I did make an ASMR video about this, uh, tier gate and, um, it was fun. Um, you know, I, I kind of got really into it in, in the video. I mean, it's a 12 minute video, but I, I discussed it as well, but no, yeah, it, it was fun. Um, and I know people are like, Oh, that was a fun experience for you. Cause it looked like a nightmare, but yeah, I mean, Jake, you know me, you know, my personality. I mean, I wasn't taking anything seriously and you know, I just, you know, I, I thrive off, off chaos and, you know, discussion. And I'm I pretty sure you, you wore the, the, I love haters shirt too. I did in the video. I was wearing an I love hater shirt because you know what, Jake, I do. They need it the most, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, moving on uh, for all the the Rams listeners that hung in there, and you know, I, I know you guys are constantly chomping at the bit to get some Rams news, and there's not a lot of, uh, out there. Uh, first, I guess we'll start with um, we we won't even start with Todd Gurley. We'll start with Jared Goff because I think. You know, one thing that has to be said is how Jared Goff has kind of come into the spotlight here. And I mean, as he should, you know, he's a 24 year old quarterback that just led his team to the Super Bowl. Um, but he's come into the spotlight because of another reason. You know, I basically if if you guys don't know, um, Mike Florio, uh, he went on to he he basically runs pro football talk which is like a branch of nbc or nbc owns them or whatever nbc sports um he goes on dan patrick's show and he basically said he's asked a question would you rather um you know sign as a franchise quarterback dak prescott or jared goff and basically he says dak prescott without question and that started a lot of controversy you can imagine um I honestly couldn't even take last week with the Cowboys fans in my mentions. Um, it was brutal. Um, you know, I just – I have such a hard time with the idea and the notion that you're going to penalize Jared Goff, who has already proven to be this quarterback that we're seeing back in his days at Cal. And – with basically nothing around him. I mean, let's be real here. Kenny Lawler and Chase Hansen were his best receivers. And you're going to penalize him because he has Sean McVay as his head coach and because he has weapons. But Dak Prescott is going to get a pass because his rookie year is which is the only reason that he's considered relevant. He's still holding on to his laurels there. And I don't think he's a bad guy. I don't. I don't hate Dak Prescott, but one my one of my biggest pet peeves is when people overrate the average or the slightly above average. And to me, Dak Prescott is somebody that can win you a football game if you have the right pieces in front of you. And you go back to his rookie year; he had the best offensive line in football. He had Ezekiel Elliott, who was a complete. Uh, you know, dynamic weapon. I mean, he had guys like Des Bryant and Terrence Williams, who at the time were solid receivers. Jason Witten, a very reliable tight end. So I don't want to hear this while he didn't have weapons like Goff does. Um, Jared Goff, on the other hand, everyone, you know, throws shade at him because he went 0 and 7 his first year, uh, kind of like Troy Aikman did, but, you know, we don't talk about that. Um, but he had Jeff Fisher and Rob Boris. And, you know, Jeff Fisher. More or less, it was Rob Boris because he was the guy calling plays. And, uh, you know, I just feel like it, it's Jared Goff is never going to get a pass because at any time it all goes back to, well, he was 0-7 with Jeff Fisher. And since Sean McVay came into the picture, everything now is credited to Sean McVay. I mean, Alexis, you know, I'm like the biggest Sean McVay fan out there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I handpicked him out of all the different coaches. So I love Sean McVay, but at some point it just becomes unfair and discredits a really good player at the position 
at the toughest position in football at quarterback in Jared Goff. I think you're discrediting him if you're saying it's all Sean McVay. I think people are also taking the fact because they saw, you know, they, they were flickering through the channels and just happened to see, um, you know, the, the mic'd up that show. They just happen to see Jared Goff getting signals from Sean McVay under center, you know, and like being told like, oh, you know, watch out for the safety or something like that. And then apparently that turns into this whole argument and this, you know, this card that, you know, Cowboys fans and Goff haters and Rams haters alike like to use. And it's that Sean McVay reads the defenses for Jared Goff. And that's just simply not true. And furthermore, if you think that's all it takes to be an NFL quarterback, you're out of your gourd. First off, Sean McVay doesn't throw the football for Jared Goff. He doesn't throw with anticipation. He doesn't look off the safety. He doesn't, you know, he, he doesn't basically, he doesn't move in the pocket. That's Jared Goff, the quarterback. He, it's not like Sean McVay's in his ear when the play starts. That cuts off right before the snap. So basically they just do a good job of getting to the line of scrimmage to try, you know, and and get as much time into that headset as possible because it cuts off at a certain time. That's all they do. It's not like he's, I feel like people think now because of that video it's like Jared Goff is being told what to do while he's on the field. That's not the case. And then you want to say, well, he has Robert Woods. He has, Cooper Cup, he has Brandon Cooks, Todd Gurley. Okay, but it's the same Robert Woods you refuse to name as a great receiver. It's the same Brandon Cooks who, you know, people continue to say is overrated. And it's the same Cooper Cup that you don't take seriously because he's a a tall, white, you know, slot receiver. Like, it's so funny how we change narratives to fit other narratives But when things like where Jerry Goff basically threw a perfect game against the Vikings, it was all Sean McVay or, you know, it was all his receivers. But it's like Jerry Goff, at some point you have to have talent. And that's kind of my thing is like, you know, that whole thing that Florio said was totally asinine to me because Jerry Goff does elevate members of his team. He may not be Tom Brady in the fact he can turn a Julian Edelman into, you know, a Super Bowl MVP or, you know, something like that. But Jared Goff, I mean, you can't penalize him because he has weapons. And kind of to end that whole, you know, rambling on that point, that rant, whatever you want to call it, Dak Prescott is still a solid quarterback. But make no mistake, Dak Prescott is solid. He's not great. He's never going to be awesome, and he's never going to be elite. Jared Goff, he could end up being one of the best quarterbacks in the National Football League. Right now, Alexis, I'd put him at number seven, which is what I I did because I had my tiers in order. Um, I think it's so funny how everyone wants to put Phillip Rivers ahead of him. What has Phillip Rivers done exactly? Seriously. I mean, I know he's been in the league for a while, but the Chargers are the most you know underachieving team I've ever seen in the NFL. They don't win anything. He's never won a Super Bowl. He's never gotten to a Super Bowl. Jared Goff has. Okay, and like the idea, well, you know, Jared Goff was carried there. Uh, Jared Goff had to come to play against the Saints. Hostile environment. You know, everyone talks about you know the the pass interference no call. Give me a break. Jared Goff went into New Orleans. They started off with a fluke turnover. Goff. Basically, it goes right off the hands of Todd Gurley. They get an interception, and they're already in the red zone to start off the game. And somehow Jared Goff came back from two scores down and led that Rams team to go to the Super Bowl. So that's also you know conveniently forgotten because he struggled in the biggest game of the year against a team that is a total dynasty and has six world championships. Okay, then. Dad Prescott's having a heart attack wherever he's at right now. <laughs> For anyone who doesn't know about Dad Prescott, you shouldn't. Um, Yeah, you know, I think it's – I think for me, and I can only base this off of what my interactions on social media, what I've seen firsthand, um, because I think 
you know, as much as analysts and people like that don't want to admit it, a lot of sports opinion is driven by social media, right? I mean, you get the good analysts and I think there's honestly very few who look at statistics, um, and that type of thing. And then you get another class of analysts who is, you know, what I see, what I see is my opinion and that's good as well. But you definitely get people who are very much influenced by social media. And here's what I can conclude from that. Um, people won't, and I don't understand why people won't let go of the Rams only scoring three points in the Super Bowl and and right or wrong. Unfortunately, that has just fallen onto Jared Goff. And I don't know why I get, I get it. He's the quarterback. He went in there, but can, are we like, are people forgetting that we played against the new England Patriots in the Super Bowl? Like, is that just lost on people? Because when people want to throw out to me, because in my uh, tier, I had Jared Goff as a borderline elite quarterback. People were like, how can a borderline elite quarterback only score three points in the Super Bowl? Matt Ryan is borderline elite. I'm like, okay, Matt Ryan blew a 28 to three lead in the Super Bowl. I mean, I don't. I don't know how that, why that's still re- relevant, and that might be me going off onto a tangent. But I just think I think Jared Goff doesn't get the credit he deserves. Yes, are there parts of Jared Goff's game that need work? Absolutely. Yes, can people say, "Oh, well, Sean McVay, you know, this and that"? And yes, that's a valid point. But I think when you look at pure talent, I think he doesn't get the credit he deserves, and I think it's sad. And you know, people will think it's biased. You know, people can think whatever, but for, you know, people to say that Dak Prescott (laughs) is a better quarterback than Jared Goff. I mean, uh, I, it's just, it's not even really worth acknowledging. I mean, I don't see the basis for that. I mean, what is, yeah. I, There's no basis I couldn't for that. agree more. I mean, you know, Dak Prescott, where do you feel Dak is the argument? Like, where do you feel, you know, oh, okay, is he as good as this guy? Well, I can tell you where I think. I, I put him on the, you know, like Jameis Winston tier. Like, is he better than Jameis Winston? Like that type of thing. You put Jameis Winston in Dallas, what would you get? Or, you, you know, somebody like that, Derek Carr. I, and even then, I'd probably pick Derek Carr over him. So, I mean, really, like, Goff, to me, is right up there with the big boys. You know, I think you have your elites in, you know, Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes, Drew Brees, Andrew Luck, Tom Brady. And, and even so, you know, I put Tom Brady in the elite tier. I think it's almost kind of unfair uh, because Tom Brady is, I don't think, is the elite quarterback that he has been throughout his career. I know everyone calls him the GOAT, but he has taken – a step back. He's not the same quarterback. He can still do what he's doing because of the game plan that has been installed by Josh McDaniels. I did want to throw that out there. The Patriots have become more of a running team and it's allowed Tom Brady to really hide the deficiencies that are starting to come up as he ages. But the the point of this whole thing is it's very simple. It's, you know, a topic that struck people's attention and, you know, we want to talk about it. And, you know, I just I look at Jared Goff and, um, you know, I, I think he's better than I, I have him ahead of Ben Roethlisberger at this point. And I can understand why people would disagree. But, um, you know, Ben Roethlisberger still makes some very questionable decisions. Um, you know, I would argue, uh, you know, the interception in the end zone, uh, I believe when they lost, they lost to Denver. And the interception in the end zone where he threw it right into the defensive back when they were at the goal line. I mean, or not defensive back, defensive tackle. Um, Here's the issue is I thought, you know, obviously the wheels came off. Pittsburgh was having a rough time. They lost to the Raiders. Did did people forget that? Like, well, Cherry Goff is going out there and, and, you know, helping the Rams drop 54 points on the Chiefs. 54-51 54-51 shootout. He had to come to play, and he did. Or, you know, that game against the Vikings, back when people thought the Vikings were like a serious Super Bowl contender. Or even back in the Saints game. You know, there's there wasn't a lot of help because, you know, t- that was the one where, um, you know, Aqib Tlaib was out, and Peters was getting roasted. So it's like the offense had... I mean, he still had some, some great plays in that game. Um, 
just the fact is I just don't think like when you look at like Ben Roethlisberger, I just feel like he didn't, there were times where he just was lost. And I think it really fell on the Steelers. Um, and, and Jared Goff doesn't throw five interceptions in a game like Ben Roethlisberger did. I think it was like last year to the the Jaguars or the year, uh, the year before last year. So that's why, I mean, I had Jared Goff ahead of Ben and then I had him ahead of Philip Rivers. Everyone wants to tell me how elite Philip Rivers is again. Why did they get absolutely annihilated against the Patriots? And Matt Ryan, Jared Goff outplayed Matt Ryan when they played against each other in the playoffs. So don't even give me that. Like the, the Falcons shouldn't have won that game. They won that game because of three giveaways by the Rams. So that's also something I don't buy. And uh, Cam Newton. Okay, Cam Newton also lost the Super Bowl. The only difference is he fumbled the ball and he had a chance to get it back and didn't go and actually dive for it. Um, the Broncos destroyed him. Um, so they're pretty much neck and neck there. He has an MVP. He's a running quarterback, all of that. But now he, all of a sudden he's having this shoulder issue and I'd take Jared Goff over him. Matthew Stafford, I have him better than an average quarterback. I think he's, I have him at 10. I think he is extremely talented. And the problem is they've gone to more of a running approach and, uh, you know, Jim Bob Cooter was just not a, a good offensive coordinator. Uh, he started off all right, and it just went all downhill from there. So they hired Daryl Bevel for some reason, who's going to just run the hell out of the ball. And Matthew Stafford, once again, will just be stuck in an offense that doesn't fit his strengths. So, yeah. So I have Jared Goff ahead of those guys. I think he's right outside the elite. I think he's right behind uh, a Tom Brady or, or Russell Wilson or somebody like that. But, um, also, the three points thing, Alexis, and I know eventually we have to get to Todd Gurley, but the three points thing I think I find really funny because you know what people don't talk about? The fact that that game was just an amazing game. You know, we want to talk about offense, right? This is the same team that scored 54 points in a game and they only scored three in the Super Bowl. How funny. But when you look at it, I mean, the Patriots were no joke. Like I just mentioned, they absolutely annihilated the Chargers. They blew them out. So your elite quarterback that everyone's trying to tell me, Philip Rivers, didn't do anything. Um, furthermore, they, like they blew them out. So the Rams defense comes to play and everyone knocks the Rams defense, you know, because they give up a lot of yards on the ground. But the Rams defense started to shore up when everyone got healthy and they, there was cohesion there. You know, you had Mark Barron back. You had, uh, you know, uh, Marcus Peters. I don't believe he was healthy. You had him healthy. You get a keep to leave healthy. You know, you had everyone back, right? And they basically did a, an amazing job of holding, you know, the elite, the GOAT, whatever you want to call him, Tom Brady. I mean, that game was neck and neck. And, you know, you can make the argument that call on John Sullivan really changed everything because the Rams were over midfield at that point, tied 3-3. No one talks about that, though. That doesn't fit the narrative. So, um, yeah, I think uh, we, we kind of hammered that down hard <laughs> that whole topic but i mean that's just kind of my thoughts i think it's really funny you know the the three points uh you know in the super bowl thing but that's how the game was i mean at the end that's just that's really it came down to really one giant play changed the whole game and uh you know that was that was the gronkowski catch but i mean you could make the argument it could have been the the penalty it could have been the brandon cooks drop i mean there's so many things so um you know, are we going to blame Jared, uh, Jared Goff for not getting it to Brandon Cooks the right way, even though the NFL came out and said that it was blatant pass interference that they missed? I, I don't know. But um, I think we, we got to we got to get off that topic because I know these you know people are loving what we're saying about Jared Goff and coming to his aid. But we also have a superstar by the name of Todd Gurley, who uh, is having some knee issues. And, and this has been, you know, pretty well stated throughout the offseason. Uh, the Rams have never really come out and had a statement on it. And I think they're they're handling this approach the way the Rams handle everything now. Um, since Sean McVay got there, they've been a pretty secretive organization. Uh, you didn't hear about the Brandon Cooks trade until you heard about the Brandon Cooks trade, right? Uh, there wasn't any like rumblings. It just happened. I think that's just how they prefer to run their organization. Very tight knit. Um, with Todd Gurley, uh, you know, it was really interesting to me because Jay Glazer used the words. It's not overblown in regards to Todd Gurley's knee. And I find it funny because I always say it is overblown. So I felt like he was literally talking right at me like, no, Jake, it's not overblown. Like, this is serious. And, 
you know, I, I could see where this could be a, a huge issue. Um, I think the Rams are going to strategically use Todd Gurley. I think this could be a huge issue if they're using him like the way uh, the Jaguars wanted to use Leonard Fournette, right? Or, or you know, Cowboys used Ezekiel Elliott. But that's why they went out and got Darrell Henderson. But what are, what are your thoughts, uh, Alexis, on this whole – this whole? Uh, I mean, this, this is kind of dominating the Rams' headlines. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on this big issue that, uh, you know, the Rams are going to have to deal with head on? You know, I think I'm torn on it because part of me likes that kind of old school mentality of keeping things under wraps, not having to share everything going on within an organization. You know, I think there's something to be respected about teams who aren't always trying to be in the headlines. They keep things to themselves. They deal with it internally. I think that's, um, to an extent, I, I think that's really cool. But at the same time, I think they're also, when you're in a business like this, you really owe it to fans to be transparent with them. Um, fans know when people are hiding things from them and when things don't add up and when things seem sketchy. We knew that in the Super Bowl when they just decided to not use Todd Gurley hardly at all, right? So it's it's really hard to keep things from the fans. And I think if there is a serious issue with Todd Gurley's knee, they need to address it. They need to at least give some type of statement on it. Um, and that should be that they don't need to come out and give us, you know, X, Y, and Z, but you know, if there's something going on, I think people should know about it. Um, but my assumption is just from what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing, I think that, they know what's going on, but I think they don't know the extent of it. I think they're kind of unsure themselves. I think they go out and they draft Darrell Henderson because they're, again, not entirely sure what's going to happen with Todd Gurley. Does he have a couple more years left in him? Does he have one more year? Does he have possibly five more years? I think they don't know. I think they're trying to work it out themselves. So I think it's something that we have to watch and we have to keep an eye on, but um, I'm not really sure how I feel about how they're handling it or not. I don't know if I'm a fan of that approach or not. I, I think it's it's a bummer because I think Todd Gurley is so talented and has done, you know, way more than what anybody, at least I, expected him to do. Um, so I don't know. I think it's it's kind of a – as a fan, you definitely are worried because you don't want to lose him and you don't want to have this kind of doubt in your chest about it and this nervousness and this anxiety. But, you know, if we think we are feeling bad, I can only imagine what he's feeling. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. Um, you know, it, it's unfortunate for Todd, you know, because this – you're looking at a generational superstar talent at running back and you're looking at somebody that could have rivaled – and I don't like saying could have because, I mean, he still could, but, um, you know, could rival, you know, the best of the best as far as, you know, rushing yards and total yards from scrimmage and all these records uh, because this Rams offense is explosive. Um, I, I think people are so quick to – assume that the Chiefs are going to be the best offense again in the NFL because they have Patrick Mahomes. And while they, you know, do have Patrick Mahomes, um, you and I, I mean, we got together for the draft and we were, we saw, you know, right on air, basically, we were talking about it, Tyreek Hill. You know, um, he, I don't know how much he's going to play if he even does play. So I do think the Rams are the most powerful offense um by default. And I still think they're even more powerful than them, even if they have Tyreek Hill. I think, you know, Darrell Henderson changes everything. But the point is, I mean, this is going to be an explosive offense. And if Todd Gurley is healthy and, and say this doesn't end up being an issue, um, the NFL needs to watch out because Darrell Henderson is less of a, you know, a role player, a guy that can fill in for Todd. Uh, you know, and he's more so like an Alvin Kamara. And I know people, you know, I, I've seen it on Twitter. I've seen it all over the place. Well, he's not a great, uh, you know, catcher of the football. You know, he, he's not a good receiving back. Um, go and look at Alvin Kamara in college and his receiving stats. I wouldn't 
you know, I would never go by just stats. Um, you know, you kind of want to leave that at the the front door and, and you, you know, just kind of move on from that because in college there are so many different focuses. You know, coaches run all different schemes. It's why you really have to, when you're scouting a player, you have to scout based on what they bring to the table, what they themselves bring to the table when you strip away all this, you know, the, um, the formula, you know, first off, the, the scheme, and then the coaching staff, and then, you know, the players around them. What do they themselves bring to the table? And Darrell Henderson is a bona fide future starter in this league. So, you know, if they have Todd Gurley healthy, I think, you know, all the power to them. If Todd Gurley is not healthy, though, I do think they can withstand it with Darrell Henderson, as crazy as that sounds, him being a rookie. But I think the Rams, they drafted him for more than just he is the the guy that's going to be there in case Todd does end up being the guy long term. You drafted a guy that you think can be a weapon in this offense at another element, you know, and I say I got to say, I think that's really the way to go. Um, I'm hoping Todd checks out. You know, I, I would hate for this to to derail such a prominent career. I mean, this is somebody that was robbed of the MVP uh, because he didn't throw a football um, two years ago against Tom Brady. And then, I mean, this year he was on pace to break LaDainian Tomlinson's single season uh, rushing record or, you know, total yards from scrimmage. uh, And then I think touchdowns record. And uh, basically he gets hurt and it kind of derailed that. But people forget. You know, Todd, he might have struggled towards the end of the year. But, I mean, the first, like, 10, 11 games, he was the MVP. <laughs> Again, like, he he should have won it last year, uh, two years ago. And then last year, I mean, the way he started off the first 10 to 11 games, I mean, you could have made an argument for him over uh, Patrick Mahomes. And that's a crazy thing. So, I mean, the Rams, you know, they have basically the – the superstar defensive lineman in Aaron Donald. They have a superstar running back in Todd Gurley. We talked about they have in Jared Goff. Um, you can only hope for the best with Todd, but, I mean, you know, regardless, it's a very talented team. And I, I'm very confident that Sean McVay isn't going to be somebody that overuses him because I think they had a plan, regardless of injury, with Darrell Henderson. I think that's really going to help them. Yeah, I mean, I think you said it you know, spot on when you, you know, we, we hope the best for Todd and we obviously hope that this is something he overcomes and ends up being fine and can work through. But if if he can't, I really like Darrell Henderson. And I think that he's got a chance to be a star in this league as well. And, uh, you know, I think it's just a waiting game. We're just gonna have to see how it goes. Oh yeah. No, I mean, that that's really what it comes down to. Um, we're not even in training camp yet. So, you know what we're hearing? Uh, things could get better. Um, you talk about Cooper Cup. I mean, they're talking about a week one. Uh, he's going to be ready for week one. I mean, he had uh, he had a rough injury. I mean, you remember he suffered, I believe it was an MCL. It was MCL sprain, like, to start, right? I mean, he got hurt first, and then he tore his ACL. Um, I believe it was the same knee. So, it, it's you've seen it. I mean, guys sometimes are on schedule or ahead of schedule or behind schedule seems like Todd right now is in the middle of that. And I think he'll be ready to go week one. But, you know, I, I don't know how much that will impact him this year. I think really the the thing that takes the wind out of your sails collectively, if you're both the Rams organization and a fan, is Todd's long-term future. And, and it just – it's unfair because, you know, again, you know, we, we don't know what's going to happen. But, I mean, if, if he were to have to retire early, that would just be a damn shame. Um, you know, this guy has Canton written all over him. If he is healthy, if he's, you know, able to do what he, you know, wants to do, um, you know, but, you know, I think, uh, there's obviously, you know, having the minds in charge like Sean McVay, I think that's really going to help. I I think, you know, these guys aren't going to overuse him and simply put, uh, I think the Rams are going to be fine either way. I know people are saying that they're going to take a step back, but, um, I think this year they, they take a step they take another step forward because regardless of his health, they showed you last year they can win with CJ Anderson. Now I like CJ Anderson, 
although he did turn down coming on the podcast once, so I'm a little bitter by that. But, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, I, I like CJ. But think about how big CJ was for the team in the playoffs last year. And while he was overweight and wasn't in football shape, and he'll be the first one to tell you that, and what would it, it, what it would be like to have a guy like Darrell Henderson replacing him? You know, I think the really the worry, if there is any, is not really about Todd Gurley. I'd be more worried about how well does this, you know, how big of a loss is Roger Saffel? Because, I mean, it is a big loss, but, I mean, you don't know until the season starts. You know, you don't know until the midway point. You don't know until the playoffs how well these guys are going to all, you know, produce. I mean, right now, the projected offensive line um, would be Whitworth, no boom, and then you're probably looking at Brian Allen at center, uh, Austin Blaise staying there at right guard, and Rob Havenstein staying there at right tackle. So then you only have two... Uh, you know, two different starters. But if you try to get cute, which the Rams could, and try to have Bobby Evans play the guard position and say you don't think Brian Allen's ready, so you move Blythe back in at his original spot center, you know, is that too much maneuvering? You know, I mean, I think Joe Nopum, who saw time last year, will be fine. Austin Blythe was amazing the first 11 games of the year, went downhill ever since that. Um, I think he'll be back. You know, I don't think Whitworth is going to take a monstrous step backward. And I think Rob Havenstein was signed long term for a reason. He's just a very solid right tackle. So, I mean, that leaves really just no boom, who's already played a little bit. Brian Allen, who, you know, obviously he's the uh, he's the center they drafted, can also play guard uh, from his days at Michigan State. Um, not a lot of playing time, although he saw some playing time when uh, Sullivan went down with an injury. I think they upgrade because I think Sullivan was just so over the hill at that point and his injuries kind of shaved off production in his career where I think the Rams might have gotten better at center, but, you know, we'll see about left guard because at the end of the day, you know, Nopum's a very athletic player, but what Saffold was able to do getting in the second level can't be understated, can't be underrated, and uh, can't be forgotten. So, you know, I think that's really... You know, we can talk about Todd Gurley and Darrell Henderson all we want, but if this offensive line doesn't come to play the way they did last year or, you know, severely regresses, then I think yes. You know, I think everything will kind of crumble. Not enough to miss the playoffs, but I could see that being the regression. To me, though, I trust Aaron Cromer, and I don't see a regression. Yeah, I mean, I don't um... – yeah, I mean, I think I think you were spot on. I don't even have a follow up to that. <laughs> I mean, you, uh, I don't know. I, I, how do how do you see this offensive line shaking out? Um, I like what we have. To be honest with you, I think that our one of our best picks in the draft, and I've said this before, was David Edwards out of Wisconsin. I mean, I can't believe he fell that low. I had him as like a second round, early third round guy. Um, I think we've got kind of a good mix of guys. I honestly couldn't tell you, though, um, what our starting five is going to be. I really couldn't because I think there's so much room for um, for people to steal positions. And we've got a very versatile group. That's how I should say it. We've got a lot of guys who I think can play multiple position, uh, multiple positions on that offensive line. And I'm excited for it. Yeah, I you know, I just think – you're missing the star power and Roger Saffold and that obviously, you know, sucks. Um, but for the most part the you know, it, the projected offensive line I mentioned, like you said, I mean, you have those guys in the back end and then, I mean, you know, uh, Vitas Frankowitz who came on, you know, he's somebody I think could make a, a run at a, you know, a spot on the, um, the rotation, not, you know, the starting rotation to start, but I mean like, you know, the, the backup, um, you know, depth filled, you know, you talk about him, Bobby Evans, I like David Edwards more than Bobby Evans. Um, so, you know, those guys, and then, uh, Brandon Hittner, uh, from Villanova, uh, you know, he's somebody UDFA. I think he could make some noise. So um, I think they just have a, like you said, versatile group, but I think they're more depth filled than in the past. Um, in the past, they've had guys like Daryl Williams and we've seen how that goes. You know, I just don't feel like it, it. I feel like it's so hard to get tackles, right? 
And I think they did a nice job of finding some tackles. Uh, Hitner and, of course, David Edwards via the draft. Um, that can definitely stay in this league. And, and I think um, Edwards is somebody that could start someday. Like you, I'm, I'm very high on Edwards. I, I totally agree with you there. Um, so that's kind of just how I see that, you know, moving forward. I was a little, uh, you know, wary on, on how – you know, how much they gave up to trade up for Bobby Evans. But if that's their project, I mean, they could have two really athletic guards in Bobby Evans and uh, no boom long term. And then say, you know, maybe they, uh, they test one of them out at tackle and that's kind of how they find their, their left tackle after Whitworth. I mean, I think really that's what it is. I think they got two athletic guys that fit today's new era left tackle mode. And, um, you know, I think it's going to be a battle for who takes over for Whitworth, Evans and, uh, and you know, of course, Nopum, both guys that were drafted in the third round. So uh, that will definitely be interesting. But, I, I, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think there's a lot of versatility. I think this team, you know, obviously has a lot going for them. You know, it's it's early on in OTAs, but, you know, we'll, we'll soon find out. But I think that's going to do it. I think it's going to wrap this one up. I think we hit the nail on the head with Goff. I think we you know, talked a bit about Todd Gurley. There's not really a ton to say because we don't really know medically what Todd Gurley has. It's been reported he has, um, you know, arthritis in his knee. We don't really know exactly what he has. So, um, you know, with that being said, thank you so much, guys, for tuning in. Jake Allen Bogan, Alexis Craft, signing out. Uh, thanks so much. Um, you can follow Alexis at the Alexis Craft. You can follow me at JK Bogan DTR. And if you like what you hear, please make sure you subscribe and review on iTunes and wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks, guys. Take care.